I'm Andy Irwin, and this is The Storytellers. We kind of are going to have a kind of a treat on this episode to be able to get into uh, a movie that we made with these guys last year called Ordinary Angels. It'll be out in theaters February 23rd. It is an amazing film. It's the highest testing film in the history of Lionsgate. And the two individuals that I have on the show today were hugely uh, uh, you know, influential in bringing that to the screen. One of those uh, is uh, a filmmaker that we have, you'll see his name on almost everything that Kingdom has done. It's a filmmaker named John Gunn. And John is somebody that, uh, uh, he's the best pure storyteller that I've ever worked with. And he just has a way of distilling stories and faith down to something that's very authentic. And uh, Ordinary Angels is his best piece of work. And you guys are in for a treat there. On the other side, producer John Berg. John Berg is a legend uh, in, uh, in, in, in film. Um, he is the producer behind movies like Elf. Uh, he also was one of the highest up people at Warner Brothers for a number of years and greenlit and launched some of my favorite movies that were ever done over there from American Sniper and others. So uh, I'm just so excited to have these guys on the show and talk about you know all things film. So without further ado, would you welcome John Gunn and John Berg to The Storytellers. So it has been a fun year. Um, you know, we've we've uh, had a lot of stuff going on, but we've got a project coming out February 23rd that we're really excited about called Ordinary Angels that uh, John Gunn, you directed, and John Berg, you brought to us and you produced it with Kevin Downs. It's special. I'll, I'll tell you something that I don't know if I've ever told uh, John Berg this, but it was funny when the project was brought to us through Lionsgate. And I read the script uh, that that existed uh, at the time, um, and then I had seen like who was attached to it, and and I said, I think I said to my wife, I was like, oh, that's funny. There's a producer named John Berg uh, on this, like the John Berg, <laughs> the, yeah, you know, the John <laughs> yeah. Berg. <laughs> and then, and then, yeah, so I was that's like, funny. that's funny. That's funny. Uh, and then I found out it was John Berg, and then I was like, uh, uh, that's the guy that made Elf. So I'm pretty intimidated now. So. <laughs> it gets, gets uh, this big, up. yeah, big fan. That's right exactly. Out of the game. By the way, the reason I wanted to make Elf just just so we can set the record straight here, just set the you know, put the bar down, is I wanted to intimidate people. <laughs> yeah, that was smart. exactly. It's, by the way, it's a very, you did it's it. a very that's intimidating yeah. movie. That's it's right. super intimidating. When you see him it. walking on the streets of New York, yeah. with the hat. When we were making it, I was like, this is going to, in the future, this is going to intimidate people. I need to make this movie. <laughs> I mean, you've got Will Ferrell in a giant elf costume, you know, um, not right. flattering, yeah. the yellow pants walking around New yeah. York City. Uh, were there any doubters along the way that thought that you guys were insane? Oh, yeah. Oh, so many. And and by the way, the good news is, and and my wife calls me Buddy the Elf, so I am... Uh, <laughs> I am I am sort of the an optimistic kind of like oh golly gee uh, kind put, of personality. Put syrup so on everything. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of candy corns, candy canes, candy, candy corn, uh, yeah. candy cane, yeah. syrup, <laughs> syrup. Four food groups. Um, but uh, yeah, there were a ton of doubters. I mean, when I went out with the script, we, I had Will attached. Um, we didn't have Favreau at that point, but we had Will attached to the script. Pretty script was was pretty close to what we ultimately, you know, the story of of the movie. I mean, it was seventy percent there. We had we had Adam McKay who came in to do some writing on it, and he had some great stuff that he added to it, uh, and a lot of funny stuff um, as well. He plays a small role in the movie. Actually, he has a little cameo. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of people were like, "You're crazy to think that uh, Will Ferrell could carry a movie." Uh, and one person in particular said to me when I went out with it, um, not only is this not going to work, but this is going to be the end of your career. Like this is, the, you're going to be one and done because this is going to be such a disaster. Um, and I just didn't, I, I totally disagreed. Uh, so <laughs> I got to tell you, I feel like every great movie, those are the ones that people always say are going to be career enders. Like Hollywood loves to say that as though yes. one movie that doesn't work will destroy it. But those tend to be the ones that, uh, of course, are career definers. And I feel like that's such an interesting, that speaks so much to the idea of being bold. Like when Andy said this movie lived on the razor's edge, like those are the movies that when they work, they really, really work. And it's it's difficult to be bold. 
And I think that Christmas movies specifically, like everybody wants to be the one to make the new perennial Christmas song or Christmas movie, right? Everybody always wants to go like, I want to make the next classic. And it's so challenging to do that. And Elf really is, interestingly, believe it or not, it's been long enough now that we all think like that is one of the the Christmas classics. It's to- totally nuts. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's 20 years uh, since the movie came out. I just was trying to make a good movie. And I and, and by the way, just to say it, there were a number of times in the making of the movie where where there was a movement to, to get rid of the heart and the sentimentality because there was a concern that it was going to be overly sentimental or corny or, you know, maybe we just go for the for humor. And, I, and, and Todd, my producing partner, and I were like, no way. This is the reason to make it. I mean, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, Capra, perfect example. Um, you know, these movies exist on their heart and, and, and the hope. And, and you can make something substantial or substantive, but also funny, right? We've, we have that. We've seen that. So, um, well, the great thing so, yeah. is that, that that heart and innocence is baked into the core conceit. I mean, Elf yeah. is, a, is a childlike character. So the fun of that, much like Big, is that you've got a childlike character experiencing the world for the first time. So the heart fits perfectly into the concept, and that's what keeps it from being like overly sentimental. So you know, Gun. You know, we've got a. We've been big fans of yours for for years, and we've got a shared history because uh, my producing partner Kevin Downs produced um, movies with you over the years, like uh, like Dandelion Dust, and uh, which is a brilliant film, and uh, your original film uh, Mercy Streets. You know, but the one thing in your body work that I haven't seen, uh, and I'm, I'm kicking myself for this, but I went over your filmography, and I've never seen My Date with Drew. That's so funny because I was going to tell you, this is good. It'll give you something to look forward to. Um, but because people ask me a lot about like the, the, we were talking about the unabashed heart of Elf and and also about, you know, making choices that seem kind of inevitable. But that was such an interesting project for me. Uh, and briefly, you know, I, I this film was a, an interesting surprise in my life. My date with Drew, just for a little bit of backstory, I was early in my career, this was 2003, I had directed one feature, um, uh, Mercy Streets, um, when I was like 25, right out of college. We raised like a million bucks and did it independently with with Kevin Downs. And a buddy of mine from film school who was three years younger than me, Brian Herzlinger, um, was really dying to make a movie, but you know, was new in town, had no money, no job, no girlfriend, no life, right? (laughs) Like 27 years old, really struggling desperate to make a film. And everyone who knows Brian knows that from the time he was six years old, he's loved Drew Barrymore. Like she was six, he was six. When he saw her in E.T., he's just always loved Drew Barrymore. So he's grown up the biggest Spielberg fan in the world. And Drew is just magical to him. And so, you know, at 27, when he was broke and had nothing going on, there was a game show, like a pilot game show for Taboo, that game Taboo. And so he had nothing else to do. So he went on the game show as a contestant. And he's a very personable guy on camera. And he won the game show. And the winning answer that won him the show was the name Drew Barrymore. And <laughs> he literally is like, it's a sign. I need to finally take this opportunity in my life. I'm going to use the money that I won from this game show to try and document my pursuit of meeting Drew Barrymore. So he called me because I was his only friend that had ever made a movie. And he said, would you help me get a date with Drew Barrymore? And I said, absolutely not. That sounds like a terrible <laughs> idea. I'm I'm not like a celebrity culture Which is kind of really, guy that doesn't you know, appeal to me. Usually your team. go-to answer up front is absolutely not. And then <laughs> that's, you through it, you think that's how you get them. Well, yeah, actually. I, I, yeah, that's how, I, that's, that's how I worked my dating life when I was in high school. So I said, no. And uh, I hung up. And my wife and I were watching TiVo. <laughs> and she said to me, she, she like paused it. And she goes, you know... If Brian could get a date with Drew Barrymore, I would want to watch that. And my wife is smart. And I was like, so I called him back and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 30 days of my life for this pursuit. 30 days. And as it turns out, Brian didn't even own a video camera. And this was 2003. No one had phones. There was no social media. There were... So we went to Circuit City and we bought a camcorder with the 30-day return policy. And we shot the movie with the camera that we then returned to get the money back. And... The money that Brian got from the game show 
that he was on, the, his, his winnings from the game show after taxes was $1,100. <laughs> That's all it was. He got like golf clubs and, and, and luggage. So anyway, so we had $1,100. That's all we had for the movie. So he didn't own a camera, so we got it from Circuit City. So the movie was basically 30 days and $1,100 for an ordinary guy to get a date with Drew Barrymore. And so then I thought, all right, it's we like have a hook. finger. <laughs> yeah, totally. And it felt like we just greenlit ourselves. And the thing that's so cool about it is that, first of all, this movie is now taught at film schools all over. I hear about it all the time because it's like what you can do with nothing. And back in those days before there were phones and stuff, you know, shooting on a camcorder that then got tra we transferred to film. We released in theaters all over the world. The thing I didn't realize about my own movie at the time was that there was something super like universally relatable about pursuing a lifelong dream. This wasn't a story about celebrity. It was a story about a guy who had always wanted to do this thing and whose friends supported him for one month to take the time to set aside to do this thing. I'm actually in it because I was part of the gang, which I'm not usually in front of the camera. So that's if you want to see me with frosted hair uh, at 30 years old. So it turned out to just be really special. But what was cool about it is it is that thing where you just sort of like can be surprised by your own projects. So <laughs> you empower all these people's dreams and then an untold number of people that probably said you've, you kind of inspired me to be a stalker, but like, <laughs> <you know. laughs> so true. Did, did, did Drew herself ever respond to it? Well, I'm, I never talk about that because uh, you have to watch the movie to see. Okay. Okay. Uh, see, I got to, that's on my to-do list. It's on my, that's right. Today, that's right. it's my homework. Well, there's something powerful about a filmmaker or a producer finding their voice. And it's like you try on different things until you're like, oh, that's what I do. I know how to do these kind of stories. And, uh, you know, each each one of us has that moment where it's like it clicked and we're like, I know what I want to say. It's not just I want a job. Yeah. I want to know what to say. You know, uh, there, there was a group of us that all started in proximity to each other. It was, you, you know, around the same time as you and Dallas Jenkins and and, uh, and, and, you know, and us and the Kendricks, and there was, there was a bunch of us that all, Devon Franklin all started in proximity, Alejandro that did sound of sound of freedom. Uh, so I kind of followed from a distance for years. And then, um, uh, I, I get a call from one of my best friends, Mike Vogel, who's a actor that, that fantastic actor. And Mike calls me and he said, well, I guess they're doing a movie of the case for Christ. And I said, I said, yeah, I heard that. And he said, yeah, they just asked me to play lee the 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 lead of the film and i said is the is the uh is the is the script good or bad he's like give me f two hours and i'll let you know and i get a text back from him two hours later he said well crap and i was like was it good crap or bad crap he's like it's good and i'm like well who's the director and he's like this guy named john gunn i don't know him and i was like oh i know john gunn i was like he did like dandelion dust it's a fantastic film i was like john's good and i was like don't let the producers for this film screw it up give me a second so i connected you and mike uh together on a text thread and you guys started talking and vogel texted back he's like i love the dude he's incredible you guys went out and made the movie and when i saw it i bought a ticket i saw it in the theater and i called you right afterwards and i was like i've just watched the greatest film on faith i've ever seen that includes my body of work and i was like that's a I'm fantastic good. honest authentic way to tell faith for you stumbling into this space of being able to, I mean, you always did heart really well, but I think you're one of the voices that has made faith believable. And we've benefited from that over the years because you've written on so many of our projects to really kind of help us find our voice on the page. How did you approach faith and how did you, because you wrestle against it, it's one of those things of absolutely not like unless, and then you figure out your angle. How did you approach faith as you kind of stepped into this, these, these kind of films? Well, I mean, I, I, I guess for me, I feel like great stories want to grapple with complicated issues, right? And faith is a complicated issue. I think the idea when you talk about faith in film, so often that those two words go together, like a faith film. And that feels like a movie that's just presenting in a positive way a worldview, which is yeah. boring, right? right? To me, that's the antithesis of like good storytelling. So, you know, what I want to do with any story that I tell is like get into the mud, right? Like, like yep. humans are complicated. 
the stories we choose to tell each other are hopefully the interesting ones, right? If you're on a road trip with someone or sitting at a coffee shop and you're like, oh my gosh, let me tell you about something that happened when I was you know, 10 years old. You don't say, I had a really lovely day one day when I was 10. Mm -hmm. And I got along great with my friends and then we had dinner and it was <laughs> and nice. And it got better you know, from there. <laughs> then you're like, why did you tell me that story? You're right. You tell me, you tell the weird stories, you tell the painful stories, you yep. tell the interesting, Struggle. complicated stories. And so, you know, faith is a really complicated issue in life. Like, you know, whether you're a person of faith who, uh, or not, or somewhere in between, it's challenging to live life, you know, believing in something, especially something that you can't always see or feel. And so with the case for Christ specifically, you know, that was a challenging project just because the book is based on Lee Strobel's journey from atheist to believer. Um, but the book is laid out primarily as a series of interviews and conversations, you know, with theologists and scholars and stuff. And so the challenge of that story was um, finding the, the, the human story. And Brian Bird, who had written the first draft, and then he and I like collaborated together throughout, and he was producer on the movie too. He's wonderful. Um, he's a friend of Lee Strobel's, and so he brought a lot to the table. And we really dialed in, for me anyway, the, ch the, the compelling part of that story was that it was a marriage story and a love story, right? It was a man um, who, was, who was grappling with the idea of faith, but the stakes of that story were his marriage, mm -hmm. yep. right? So to me- And I thought Erica Christensen- uh, absolutely anchored that film. Like she was fantastic. She's beautiful. So for me, I fought very, very hard for the cast, right? Yep. It was critically important that we find heart and soul in, in the cast. That's always the case. Um, and then to find the love story that was, that was yep. the stakes of the movie. Um, then it gave us something to work from. Like here's a couple that's happy in their married life. And then one of them finds faith and the other is an atheist, right? Yeah. A, a husband who sees his wife start to go down a path that feels to him like a cult and feels to him like the thing that will tear them apart and destroy their marriage. Hmm. And so that became very interesting to me. A man on a desperate pursuit to disprove Christianity as a way to save his life, his wife and her life in their marriage, uh, now you've got a lot of complexity, right? And so then we started to just figure out how to grapple with that in honest ways. And, and also to have us, you know, Lee Strobel was a journalist for Chicago Tribune, an award-winning journalist and a very smart man in 1980. And so in order to, you know, maintain the credibility of that guy's character, it couldn't be an easy transition. He couldn't just go like, oh, I've strongly and staunchly believed that uh, Christianity is stupid and people that follow it, that yeah. it's a folly, you know, to then believe it. Like that had to be a really, you had to earn that journey. And yep. so I kept trying to poke holes in it as we went the way that I think he would poke holes in it as an atheist. So, uh, you know, in general, I think, you know, Lee, Lee was a big part of well, it. Well, and I think and I think the, Mike the, was wonderful in that role. Yeah, and Vog Vogel killed it. He's fantastic. He's you know one of my favorite actors that I've never worked with. We just keep looking for excuses, and then it's funny to watch two filmmakers get super jealous when an actor they both want to work with walks in the room. And so we we literally have a, a tug of war uh, over Mike anytime we're all in the same <laughs> room. But uh, you know, I think there is something powerful when approaching faith to approach it from the point of view of a cynic because when you can when you can convince the character in the film of the worthiness of what the belief is through their life struggle the audience goes with that they 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 convince when they they believe that the the protagonist believes it and so uh i think there was something powerful you tapped into so that when we you know uh had our moment with i can only imagine we decided to start kingdom story company we were like, who's the first on the wish list to work with? And we're like, it's got to be John Gunn. Like, he's the guy. So you've literally had your fingerprints all over everything that we've done that's come through, uh, you know, the doors. And, you know, even to the fact of, you know, on set of I Still Believe, you're one of the writers on that that wrote the script, and you're on set, and way too comfortable, I might add. You're like, I'm stressing out of my mind. I've got 3,000 extras in the audience, and you're overeating popcorn trying to, come up for some fake character for you being in the background of one of the scenes. And I'm like, gun, I'm drowning here. But, uh, <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. And I, and I found that like a players like to work with a players instead of there being a heightening of ego, when people are really good at their job, it's just, it comes, becomes about the story. Like, how do we make the story great? I don't care about resume. And so I think we've had that relationship for you, uh, Berg, you know, you had several successful movies. You had quite a career, but then that kind of lands you at Warner brothers 
you know, as the big boss in charge of film at Warner Brothers. And during your season of time there, you oversaw and greenlit some of my favorite films that they've done, you know, over the years, especially like Sherlock Holmes. I think Edge of Tomorrow was there when you were there. Uh, uh, and Wonder Woman, Alan Heinberg, the writer for that is one of my dear friends. And so you had a, 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 a string of those. What was it like switching from being a producer to being on the other side of the desk and yeah. being the kind of the big boss? Well, uh, you're kind. Uh, I, I was not the big boss uh, uh, for a, a long time. I was just a you know an exec uh, working there. Um, and similarity is with producing is passion. Uh, yeah. You just have to you know you have to you know your job is really you're you're sat in an office and you're reading scripts, hearing pitches, taking phone calls, being sent articles, books, yeah. etc. And you're trying to sift through it all and and find what you think would be a movie that people would really love to go see. The 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 Warner Brothers thing was cool, man. It's a um, huge machine to get movies out to the world. Yeah. Um, when I was there, I think it was kind of like the end of the heyday of sort of movie making where we weren't just making um, uh, big pieces of IP. There were, you know, I got to make Argo and I got to yeah. make American Sniper and I got to make due date with Robert and Zach Galifianakis and you know you could make original uh movies so yeah it was it was super cool well during that time that kind of led to this moment in time where you know you knew that your your time at Warner Brothers was going to have a, a shelf life you wanted to kind of branch out and pr produce on your own again and it led to you kind of taking this risky swing of this like hey let's just invite I think it was your assistant you talked to and said who do you want to invite in yeah. To the studio? Yeah. I said to my assistant, Samantha Nissenbaum, uh, uh, shout out to Samantha Nissenbaum, who's a producer in her own right and is amazing. I was like, look, I have this silly job where I can kind of meet with anybody. Um, is there anybody that you would like me to meet with so that you could meet them? <laughs> and she said, yes. Immediately. She was like, I've been to 100 Dave Matthews shows. If you can meet with <laughs> Dave Matthews. <laughs> like, that's your guy, Dave Matthews. That's it. It can be anybody. It was anybody. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. okay, cool. So let me see if I can meet with Dave Matthews. Called up a uh, manager I knew who, who worked with Dave. And before you knew it, Dave Matthews was in my office. And I, I intentionally showed up late uh, to the meeting by about five minutes. So Dave and my assistant, Samantha, would just be alone to kind of <laughs> chill. Hilarious. It's amazing. You're a good man. And, and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, and Dave and I like sat for an hour and a half and he is hilarious. And he was working on his album and uh, just we were joking and talking about movies and be kind of just having a great time. And then at the end of it, he was like, listen, I, I should probably tell you something because I have a little production company, something that we're working on. Um, uh, that's why we were getting together. We just we've gone off topic in 100 different directions. And he, but he pitched me Ordinary Angels and it was a beautiful pitch. And um, and I wanted to read the script right away. And he sent it to me and I and I read it. And I was really moved. You know, it was um, a story. How did he, he? How did he find it? Like, wh how did that find Dave Matthews? So uh, it, it, he he and his producing partner, who's a guy named John Jonathan Dorfman, had found the story. It was brought to them by, and John and I know uh, Rick Baker, uh, who originally found the story and got the life rights to the Schmidt family and to Sharon Stevens. So wow, came through Rick. You know, these things take on iterations and the pieces don't come together in the right way. And so, uh, yeah. So then at some point, John, I don't remember, how did you bring it to Lionsgate? Um, Nathan Kahane at Lionsgate is somebody that I worked with in 1996. We were at the same company or wow. 90, 97 uh, at Warner Brothers. We were working for a producer, um, uh, both as assistants in, in his company and uh, so Nathan was running Lionsgate. And then my uh, uh, producing partner on Elf is a guy named Todd Komernicki, um, who, you know, you guys know. And But he recommended that I go in to Lionsgate because Lionsgate had to deal with you guys. <laughs> right. So I have breakfast with Nathan. And, you know, it was one of the two things that I pitched to him. And uh, he read the script and, you know, uh, felt as, as we did, felt passion for it. And it's, it's a fantastic story. You know, we've invested a lot of our brand in true stories that deliver a rush of hope. And rush of hope is really kind of the DNA of the experience that kind of unites our brand. Um, you know, both subversive and overt faith, depending on what the story demands. But the rush of hope is the, the thing that is the unifying 
uh, concept. And when you brought it to us, um, a couple of things. Number one, it's a fantastic story. And the, the story is of the Schmidt family that uh, the uh, Ed's wife has passed away of uh, a, a, of an illness, dealing with her liver. She dies. It turns out that the, the, the same condition uh, his young daughter has. And uh, and so after having just uh, buried his wife and have way in over his head over in debt, trying to hold on to to his family, uh, he's fighting for his daughter's life. And then this unlikely hero, Sharon, comes into the picture and kind of becomes obsessed uh, in this Aaron Brockovich way of not taking no for an answer uh, that I'm gonna I'm gonna save this family and, and rally the whole community around her led to you know this amazing uh, story that unfolds involving a church called Southeast Christian Church. The crazy thing is the chairman of our board at Kingdom goes to that church and has gone to that church for 20 years. And so there was like, when Nathan brought it to us, we were like, number one, absolutely checks the box of what we know how to do. Secondly, we know the church well. And so it was kind of meant to be. And then for you, Gunn, uh, you know, starting with your typical answer of absolutely not, and then switching to unless, and then it in turns into absolutely yes. Uh, what was it that when you first heard the story, because it took you a second to crack it, but when you cracked it, like it, 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 it unlocked what the story was meant to be. Like, what was yeah. it that drew you in? Well, first of all, it was a unique project for us because, as you were saying earlier, Andy, we were very busy with a whole slate of projects that we had created in-house at Kingdom, right, with Lionsgate. So I think I'd been co-writing with Irwin on like five movies at the time, right? We, we did I Still Believe, we did American Underdog, we did... Um, uh, Jesus Revolution. Jesus Revolution. We And in the midst of all of that, projects that we developed internally for Lionsgate to distribute... Lionsgate came to us and said, look, we want to be partners creatively, not just as your financiers or distributors. We have a project that we love very much that we think would be a great fit. Would you guys look at it and consider it? I remember saying to my wife, this was a really good script. <laughs> like, you know, right. like I was just surprised in some ways that like I really enjoyed reading this so much. And so when they came back to us and said, we're serious at Lionsgate, would you like to do this? Then I think, you know, Erwin and I sat down to go like, all right, there's something really solid here. And there were some things that I wanted to dig into slightly differently, right? Um, just as far as really leaning into the Aaron Brockovich of who she was, of who Sharon was, and the brokenness of who she was. I wanted, yeah. uh, and um, you know, the 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 joy of the tension of the story was a man who very much needed help, mm -hmm. but didn't want it, right? Because yep. he was a proud man. He's a you know sort of blue collar, hardworking father determined to sort of handle it on his own, but it was more than he could handle. He right. needed help, but didn't want it. So the perfect foil to him was a woman who was going to give help whether he liked it or not. And so I wanted to really lean into that. But, yep. but truthfully, for me, like as I was trying to crack my version of what I could bring to this story, what I ended up really landing on that I loved, especially in this moment in time in the world, was this thematic exploration of how helping other people is how we heal ourselves, hmm. right? And there's a lot of versions of that in the world, you know, even sure. when, when, even through AA, when people say, yeah, you, know, you have to give, give, it away. give it away to keep yeah. it, right? And so I loved that idea that Sharon needed help just as much as Ed did, yeah. right? She needed healing just as much as Ed did. And, and I really wanted to find what is the crack in the nobility of what she's doing, right? Yeah. If she's just a good woman doing a good thing, that's There's not no very tension interesting, there. right? Yeah. And I knew that, that it must have been frustrating for Ed to have someone helping when he didn't want it. And so then you look at the real life, complicated, messy, human part of like, sometimes people are like, dude, you're a lot. Like you're <laughs> helping me, but you're a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. you <know? laughs> and so I thought that could really be fun, right? In, in the way that Aaron Brockovich is and, and yep. those kinds of characters that are larger than life, colorful, but broken, right? And, and I think that the, the healing of both of them and the unifying of a community, right, around this family in need gives you that rush of hope in a really nice, messy way. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, for me, it was like dialing all of those dials the right way so that we could love Sharon, even in her brokenness, and love Ed, even in his sort of like, you know, stubbornness. And, uh, and I think that really worked out well because we had two amazing actors, you know, um, leading that film with Alan Richson as Ed and Sharon and, and Hillary Swank as Sharon. Yeah. Uh, the two of them just really great were dance partners. Together. They're incredible.
Berg, you know, we were all producers on this, uh, my brother and I and, and, and Dave Matthews. And, um, but you and Kevin Downs uh, were the lead producers on this. This was your kind of baby to see through. Uh, you know, there's so much that hinges on, I, I think, what the DNA of the packaging a potentially great film. It comes down to the script and the concept first. But then it's really about the casting. And you look at the versions of a movie of what could have been, and you realize, man, totally different movie. So in this one, with Alan Richson from the Reacher series, who is uh, a, a quickly ascending star, and you've got a two-time Oscar winner in Hilary Swank. Uh, talk to Not me a bad. little bit about the, the casting process and when Hillary si signed on, yeah. the reaction in the room of like, oh, okay, this is a different movie. I mean, we, so we, uh, yeah, the casting of it is so key. Um, also Nancy Travis, uh, who plays yeah. um, uh, Ed Schmidt's mother. Uh, Which was uh, my lone contri contribution to the casting. That I was, was like... great. That was a great job. <laughs> that was a great job. It, it was, we needed that at a sort of a last minute. We had, a um, sadly, a, an actor contract COVID. Um uh, yeah, I mean, so, you know, Ed Schmitz, as John said, very particular type of guy, proud construction guy, blue collar, uh, Southern, um, and also uh, broken and, and, uh, uh, holding people off sort of, you know, having left his church and we won't go back and he's really struggling. And so we needed somebody who could play the physicality, but also, um, yeah. had the chops and had the range, the, the dynamic range. And um, we saw Alan uh, in um, Reacher, and then we looked at his other work, too. He's got some amazing, like, comedic work and dramatic yep. work and just fell in love with him and, and um, had a meeting with him and, and discovered he is uh, a person of faith and yep. uh, it's important to him. And he read the script. He really became passionate about it. He's a father, um, husband. You know, he felt some connection to the Ed Schmidt character and then... Uh, John met with him and um, they had an incredible meeting and really saw things eye to eye. I let John talk about that. But that was a great uh, uh, get for us to get Alan uh, into the movie. And and we told Lionsgate because he wasn't sort of a, he wasn't as big of a of a name and a star as he is now. He's only yeah. his star is only uh, rising, rising. Um, from Fast and Furious and, and other stuff that he's doing is a big deal at Amazon. He's making movies there. But um we pitched our passion to Lionsgate, and they listened and and uh, um, were on board. They they came on board, and then with Hillary, you know, um, that was an incredible get. I mean, she's such a great actor. Uh, you know, of course, we know her from uh, Million Dollar Baby and and many many other things. Uh, and she just we needed somebody. We needed somebody who could carry the movie, who could carry the, the dramatic stuff, and also who had. Um, uh, you know, a lightness and a and a uh, just a, a magnetism, you know, and electricity, and and she has all that. So when we got her, we were like, you know, we we landed that we landed the absolute right person. And, she and was it, just game. And it came it came like right up to the last minute where yeah. we had to cast somebody, which is yeah. usually when you find potential brilliance in a film is it's up to the last minute where. You find the right actor. They're passionate about it. It's a moving train. You got to jump on, and it's like you know, it all things could either fall apart really quickly, and then all of a sudden they're on set and you're making a movie together. It's kind of you yeah, know the we, magic. And we had of, dances of with yeah, we had dances as you say with some other people. We didn't quite land that person. It's a challenging role, you know. Hillary's Very. incredibly brave. You know, there's nothing to hide behind, and nope. it's really that character and and bearing her soul, and it's about performance. You know, which John, well, by the way, I will say. Uh, I know you're going to uh, go there next, so I'll, I'll uh, cue you. Um, this movie exists and skates solely on its tonality and its yep. veracity. And John Gunn uh, was absolutely magical in how he, in, in doing the final rewrite on the script, landed the script, landed the story, landed the dialogue, landed the tone. Yep. The and tone. then he was able to... Um, orchestrate uh, the actors and the and camera and everything production design performance to pull it off and it's and it's so rewarding to see this movie with an audience you know it's that's the great magic trick of what we do or the payoff to the magic trick is you get to show it to people and they are just emotionally bowled over by this yeah. movie and cheering in the end.
Well, and I want to get to the audience reaction in a minute, but for you, Gunn, I, I totally agree with Berg. The tone is absolutely right. And one of the most challenging things I think as a director is when you have two really big actors in a scene uh, of getting the the chemistry and the dynamic right, especially when you have somebody that can be very dominating in Sharon with somebody that can easily fade into the background with Ed being quiet and sh the strong, quiet type. But the way you orchestrated the dance steps between the two of them and the way that maybe they were a big part of that as well. But, you know, uh, Hillary at times is big and, and needs to play this big, larger than life character. But Ed absolutely is her equal dance partner and grounds the scene. There was something special between the two of them. How did you guys find that along the way? Yeah, I mean, that's where I think the casting is always so important. And we really were fortunate that Lionsgate believed in us when we said Ed is our guy, that Alan Richson is our guy. Because, I mean, look, what's funny about, even though Reacher is a very different tone, of course, yeah. Reacher is an action movie and it's elevated in a different way. This is a very grounded human story. But the thing about Reacher that you'll notice is that he says almost nothing, but he commands the screen. Mm. And Ed, I found even when I was doing a pass at the script, because I talk a lot as a person and I <laughs> like to write, you know, Ed was a guy of very few words. And so it was always a challenge for me to say, like, let's how few words can we use for yep. this man and let Sharon be the one that does all the talking and that pulls out of him. And so we needed an actor that could, in his silence, still carry the weight of, the, you know, balance the scales. And Alan is a guy that just draws your eye to him. He's well, physically imposing. He's just great. On, he lives in, all, you know, with the, so many emotions the, the, without the, the, saying anything. Yeah, there's so there's something really interesting about actors that can do this, that it, it, it's it's it, they might be the strong silent type. They might be silent, but they're they're not passive. They're yeah, very they're active. And uh, I, I think, Berg, you had the same thing with, you know, Bob Newhart in, in Elf. There's a guy that's a man of few words, but he is never passive. And he just sucks you in. And, like, as a result, he steals the show, I think, in Elf. It's his finest performance in his body of work, I feel. So for somebody like Alan, I feel like, like he absolutely grounded this movie and allowed Hillary to do all the twirls and the pretty stuff. But he's the anchor of the dance. Well, and I think that he, you know, he is a father as well. When I met with him, I could tell he was extremely emotionally connected to this material and invested. And he's a smart actor. And so, like, he can make you laugh or cry, you know, in this movie without saying anything, yep. which is great. But then also he's set up and supported by all the things that Hillary is doing. Yep. And I have to take a minute just to say, too, that I actually have been genuinely been like a huge fan of Hilary Swank for a very long time. From, yeah. Like I remember Boys Don't Cry. I remember seeing her in some smaller roles that other people probably haven't seen, like sure. indie movies right. where she played a really funny character who worked at a convenience store with braces in this like indie film where she was hilarious. And I thought like, what? then then she was in The Gift, mm -hmm. uh, which is a movie that. that I don't know if a lot of people remember, but, but Sam uh, Raimi, Keanu right. Reeves. Yeah. Sam Raimi movie, and she's she she came right out of Boys Don't Cry into that role, and she was she was an abused wife, and she was, you know, heart, heartbreaking and compelling. And then when I saw Boys Don't Cry, I I mean I, when I saw Million Dollar Baby, Million Dollar Baby, that's one perfect. of those movies. I went back to the theater three times in the first week Me to too. see that film. I brought other people. I just kept watching that movie. So when when she came up, and I knew she could be funny, and that people didn't use her comedy as much. And then, but when you look at Million Dollar Baby, she's adorable and yeah. hilarious and heart -breaking. charming. Um, and so I remember when we were going through the process of like last minute, we got her on board, but we're still working it all out. And you know how these deals can fall apart, right? Yeah. And so I was sort of protecting my heart a, a little. Uh, I've been there. And I, and I said to her, I actually, when we finally locked her in and it's like, she's in and I got to like have the call with her where I knew she was on board. I said this thing to her, which is very true. Uh, and I said, oh, you know, the process of directing a film or producing a film is filled with a million little heartbreaks, right, hmm. along the way. You have to be prepared for yep. you're not going to get that actor. You're not going to get that location. That vintage jacket that you love yep. doesn't fit the actor that you cast. I you love know? It. Um, You know, like even supporting cast members, a song that you want in post, yep. you know, big and little things. There's so many little heartbreaks along the way you have to be prepared for. So I told her, like, when I heard that we may have you, 
I didn't want to go back and rewatch Million Dollar Baby until I knew we had you because it was just going to break my heart too much. <laughs> yeah. And so this moment for me is filled with such joy. And she was like, that's such a nice thing for you to say. So I rewatched Million Dollar Baby from the hotel where I was staying when we were making the movie. And I was just overwhelmed that I got to work with this woman. Like I was so excited. And she's, uh, she brought all of that, right. You know, she did. she's just, and so, and then to watch Alan rise up to that and to get to play a role that no one has seen him play in all of Mm-mm. his various roles. It's his, he's it's his best work. He's great. And he's great. And he loves the movie and they together, they're a joy. So, and what I love about watching it with an audience, you know, that I feel really succeeds with the film is that on its surface, it could seem like a sad idea. It's a, you know, a father who's lost his wife, whose daughter is sick and dying. Um, and so I think we all talked about this internally and I really strived or strove, uh, to, uh, to accomplish this thing where we, we lift the movie every few minutes. There's always yep. a laugh. There's always a light moment. There's levity to balance the pain. Yep. And when you watch it with a crowd, I, mean, I tell you, I remember seeing it with the crowd where it felt almost like a comedy, like how often people were laughing, the release that you get from those laughs, right? Um, in the midst of struggle. And I think the laughter is so much more powerful when it comes unexpectedly and when it comes out of mm-hmm. pain, right? And struggle. Yep. So I'm based. so happy with, with that, with that, how that, that balance came together and what a joyful movie it is and what a, a movie about community coming together and about hope and about uh, gratitude. So, uh, yeah, I'm thrilled with it. I can't wait to share it. You know, you, it takes so long for movies sometimes to make it all the way out to the theater and to share it with the world that we've been sitting on this sort of gem for quite a long time. Well, now, and, and, and sitting on the gem, and then I, I want to get, get your response to this bird, but, um, you know, sitting on a gem, it's, you know, you really don't know what you have, uh, until you test the film. Uh, you, you, you know what you hope you have, but the audience is the jury. They're the ones that decide the verdict. And you never feel so naked as a filmmaker, as you do the first test screening, and uh, trying to sit as the far the back corner as you can. Nobody knows you're in the room. And they dig into every insecurity you've ever had or ever will have about your film. And you have to listen to the audience, audience's unvarnished response. And But you get this sense in a room where you just you see whether the audience is going to go with it or whether they're going to reject it. And you can feel it. It's a visceral feeling. And then when it is working, it's the best elated feeling you have. So the film tests. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the DNA of what you talked about and making sure that you give the audience a lift, you know, to kind of keep them on the journey. I think, you know, there's something about the, the rush of hope, the DNA for that in a film is really in retrospect of how daring you are to at key moments to hold the audience underwater, but not hold them underwater so long as they drowned. But hold them underwater enough that when they come up, they're grateful for air And they come up gasping and say, I'm alive and all is well in the world. And that's the rush of hope. And I think that's the key to an A-plus cinema score. And Gunn, you have one. Uh, I've been privileged to have three. My brother has a fourth. There's something in an A-plus cinema score that everybody leaves the audience or leaves the theater with a communal experience that that was well worth it. The thing about this film that really impressed is we did those first test screenings. And it scored a 98 on the top two boxes twice, which was... Uh, two separate cities, and both were the highest test score in the history of Lionsgate. Uh, it was a cool moment for all of us. So, like Berg, for you, you know, as a, a producer that has produced big movies and then sat on the other de- the side of the desk and greenlit m- hit movies, what was the DNA of this film in that communal experience of the test screenings? What does this audience get? What does the film deliver? Well, you're so right that you're you're all the insecurities. It's a nervous, it's yep. a nervous process. I've never been in a in a test screening. I've never actually been in a test screening of a movie that's not mine. But I would assume that even in that scenario, I would have sympathetic uh, anxiety. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're just it's just nervous making. But yeah, when um, certainly when you. Uh, you know, we had, we had the goods, you know, we have a movie that really works. So it was incredibly rewarding to be in those screenings and, um, and, and feel the movie and feel it with the audience and, um, feel them on the edge of their seats or nervous or concerned. And then, you know, having a laugh and having a release. And then there's, there's an upswing and upswell of, uh, heart and optimism in the end. And, 
it's an incredible experience watching this movie with people. It really is very rewarding. It's all the and more than I hoped uh, for when I originally uh, read the script. And I also just want to say as an aside uh, that the process of making this movie with you guys, with with Kevin, with John, with you, Andy, with, with your brother, John, the whole team, the process of making this movie was st- – and Courtney, incredibly enjoyable and rewarding. I mean, I just loved the process of making the movie and the team that we worked with in Winnipeg, uh, all the fine people up there and the crew. It was, uh, we all felt like we were on the same page. Drew Powell, I mean, I could go on and on, just yeah. the special people that I met through this uh, experience that I'm uh, lucky to count as friends and want to continue to make movies with. Um, but yeah. Yeah, one, one of the things we didn't mention uh, that that this you know this film culminates in a third act that is representing the wor- we had to recreate the worst blizzard in Kentucky history. Yeah, um, the movie set in 1993, 1994, and so we did. We shot the movie in Winnipeg in the snow, in hmm. the bitter cold, in the real snow. We wanted real snow uh, because the whole third act is this blizzard. Um, it's kind of a man versus nature movie in a lot yeah. of ways. Um, and the community that rallies around Ed and his daughter is is coming out into a blizzard to carve a path to save this girl's life through the storm. So we did shoot in very unforgiving circumstances in an environment of freezing cold snow with hundreds of people out there. Um, and uh, and it was, which is the most exciting way to make a movie. And uh, it was challenging, but so much fun. Not the and, most warm uh, way of making a not, movie. Not, <laughs> not, yeah, not the warmest way. <laughs> Pain is temporary, film is forever. But yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. No, it's 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 um, it's a beautiful experience, and I think that um, it's a it's a film. I think the best compliment, like you were saying, Berg, the best compliment that can be made to the process of making a movie is when you can get to the painful experience of doing it in the cold of winter and the elements stacked against you with the sleepless nights and the pressure cooker of making a film. And when you can get to the end of that movie and say, Hey, let's all do another one together. That's the best compliment that you've made a really good film. Uh, because a lot of times there's other experiences that we've all had where we're like, I never want to see you again. And, uh, and I think, you know, when you want to do it together again, it means that you've just done something really special. That it's been a great experience. And it's Gun- also, and it's also ahead, just Jeff. to say it, sorry, just to say it, it's unique. You know, we work in a business. It's, a, it's tough. It's, uh, yeah. for all the reasons you've just, uh, uh, elucidated and, um, you can often make it, make movies with someone or, or or more than just a someone who you don't enjoy working with and you don't want to repeat that and that and that magically wasn't the case on this and not so magically because gunn made it a point i mean he yeah. had a he announced it in our first meeting uh production meeting he's like i have a no jerk policy I love and that. right. And that was just I don't want I want people to enjoy the process. I want them to have fun. I want them to work hard. I want them to feel supported. Um, and that was the standard uh, to which everything was held from the get go. That's beautiful. You know, for you, Gun, and then I want to ask this and then a, a few wrap up questions. But for you, there's something about a really good movie. And when you can have a communal experience like that, where the audience really goes on the journey, usually it comes down to you've tapped into something that's simplistic and profound and universally relatable, like distilling ordinary angels down to what does it deliver? What is the experience? What's the universal journey that people are taking in the theater? What is it about this story that they connect with? I think it's the healing, you know? I mean, I think it is a movie about healing through community and that's why I loved it so much because, you know, we live in a time that's, that there's so much toxicity and division within community right now. This was just a great reminder of what, you know, of a moment in time when people come together for strangers because it's the right thing to do. And by the good feeling you get to watch people rush to help somebody in need that they don't even know. And so and how healing that can be and how uplifting that can be to see people come together. Um, We all love those moments, you know, when you watch people circle up and lift each other up. Um, And I have to say in the midst of that, since we've been talking about the great gift of our cast, that this is also a movie about a family with two young daughters. And and the girl at the center of this, this sick girl, five years old, is such a challenge when it comes to casting. She's amazing. Emily Mitchell is like this 
precious child, five years old, incredible what she can do as an actress. And her older sister uh, is is played by Skywalker Hughes, which is just the coolest name. Her name is Skywalker. I love it. And these two girls are just incredible. Like I, I've, I've done a lot of movies with kids. I, I really like working with kids. Um, but it is a challenge because you have less time with them and, mm -hmm. you know, they're younger and yep. their attention span, especially when they're five, just even learning lines and being in the moment. And the family that we got to have, you know, with Nancy Travis, who's so amazing as a grandmother and such an incredible actress that I grew up watching in movies like Three Men and a Baby. And so I married an axe murderer. And all these yeah, I love things. it. Um, so with Hillary and Alan and then having Nancy as the sort of matriarch of this family and then these two girls, Emily and Skywalker, uh, really are special, like really are yep. special. These kids, you'll see, they just live very honestly in the film. It's complicated, it's charming, it's funny, it's heartbreaking, all that stuff. So uh, it was, as a cast, you know, it was a joy for me to have them all to work with and to see them come to life. They're all so excited about the movie. And, and you know, the Schmidt, the Schmidt family, who there's, is the story we're telling, the, uh, Ashley Schmidt is the, you know, the, the real sister that Skywalker plays. She and Ed and, um, you know, their their family are just, yeah, I think it's surreal for them to watch their life, mm. you know, be brought uh, into the cinemas in this way. They've been incredibly supportive along with the real Sharon. So it's it's cool. It's like there's the real family and the movie family. Yeah. And everybody is family in this project. I, uh, Skywalker, uh, I adored her in the film. And the, I think the, the, the best direction... Uh, you know, you've got a really good director working with a kid actor. Um, when that kid has the courage to sit still. And uh, the scene, the graveyard scene with her and Alan, when they're sitting there and she's challenging him, like, why don't you talk to God anymore? And and she's talking to him in this, like, old soul way. And then he finally turns to her and says, you first. Like, it gets me emotionally every time. Totally. Uh, there's something really, really, really special about it. And it's funny how that can happen because that was a late addition. I wrote that into the script very it's my late favorite scene. I, want, I wanted a moment with them, and that can very often happen. And then also just the thing, like Skywalker can live very naturally in front of the camera. I noticed it from her audition. But I remember even with that scene, like, honestly, that was a big part of what I said to her time and time again, especially with that scene, which is you don't have to, like, do less, even yeah, less. Be still. You don't need to move at all. Yeah. And you can speak so softly. Like a lot of times that's a nice piece of direction for, for anybody, but for kids in particular, yep. it's just like, say it quietly, you know, yep. say it like it's a secret. Like, let's get quiet in this moment. Don't love have it. to move. You don't have to look at them. Let's just sit here. And, and so we did, we got smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Even in the takes on that one scene. And it turns out to, to be larger when it's smaller, you know, and uh, I love and, that moment too. I think they're wonderful. It's an ama amazing moment and, and crazily, right, in the making of a movie, we were under the gun schedule-wise. And I remember that was the, <laughs> sort of a dangler, like a scene like, do we, Man. can we can we fit that in? How do we fit that yeah. in? How do we prioritize? And it was, and all of us um, fell in love with that scene as John wrote it. And I agree. And I think the piece of music I, yep. I, gets me teary every time uh, yep. the piece of music comes on. Yeah, it's um, a great so, needle yeah. drop. Yeah, it's a good needle drop. And him yeah. going back to church also gets me, right, where, um, where mm -hmm. uh, Drew Powell, Pastor Dave, uh, acknowledges him and says, I'm yep. glad you're back, Ed. Um, yeah. Well, and I think a big part of our brand and what we're trying to do is we are unabashedly at Kingdom. We are about stories of faith. Uh, uh, and I like what you, the distinction that you made, John. It's not like just a tag of faith film of like a cause it's more of less a, a slice of life and a, a group of people that we want to portray their human struggle and uh, validate their experience. Uh, but we want what we're doing, and rather than being an exclusion of people, it's like, this is for us, not you. We want it to be an invitation. And so moments like that, moments coming back to church and stepping back and then being welcomed back in, it's a big deal for us uh, in our brand of being able to reach what we call the benevolent skeptic, people that don't know that they're going to love a story of faith and they're really caught off guard. And I think this movie delivers it in droves. So the thing that we're excited about, it comes out in February, February 26th or 23rd. Uh, and uh, it's going to be out everywhere. And uh, I've never been more proud uh, of a story that we've done at Kingdom. I think it sets the bar in a whole new way. Uh, I think you're going to get another A-plus cinema score for sure. Uh, Gun, it absolutely deserves it. And so uh, really, really proud of it. Uh, just as we kind of wrap things up, 
just want to just kind of a fun question to kind of just throw out and then we'll we'll, we'll kind of end things on this uh is i love you know seeing a story that connects with me on an unexpected emotional place uh uh whether i've had anything to do with it or not it just catches me off guard and i have that experience where i just stop being a film critic i stop being somebody that works in the industry and i'm just absorbed in an emotional vicarious kind of moment so as far as a rush of hope sticking the you know kind of sticking the landing at the ending of a film uh for each of you what story that you weren't involved in uh or uh stuck the landing for you and you were transported uh as a viewer what's your favorite you know kind of rush of hope ending of a movie that that gets you every time mm. i have one off the top of my head uh which is field of dreams um, yes playing catch with dad Play catch. you know um uh gets me every time and that's that's a uh that's a beautiful uh ending to a film so that that one that one resonates there's something universally relatable about wanting to to connect with your father you know that was a big big part of what field of dreams was a big part of the inspiration for the end of i can only imagine is if we can get to that place of approval from your father that's where it really that's i love that one gun what about you Oh man, that's a good question. So, so many. I'll, I'll tell you one one thing. This may be a little different, but when I saw Shawshank Redemption for the first time, I remembered that being like that's a movie that ends a few different times, really, right? Yeah. But but it's but it's but I never wanted it to stop going. Yes. Like I remember in the theater going like, oh, I hope this keeps. I want to see these yep. men get brought back together. Um, and it was so rewarding to take the time to sort of finish your film. You know, I don't want to ruin the movie for anyone, but you know, if they've had enough time, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think like okay, he's gotten away, he's gotten a new life, the movie's over, but then there's a whole extra like 20 minutes where they find them their, each other again at the end. Um, but I will tell you too, though, that honestly, one of the great the, this is going to sound uh, a little self-serving here in this moment, but when I saw, I can only imagine um, that ending for me really caught me like when he's singing that song on mm. stage and we spin around his father is standing there alone mm. in the audience that was one of those ones where not only did it get me it it was annoying to me that it got me because i knew <laughs> something like that was probably coming yeah but you know like that's the power right mm. where you see a thing you're like wow to see dad standing there alone you know from mm. the afterlife all lit with the smile on his face that, that dennis quaid smile thanks man just you know just weeping and 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 it's lovely when a movie can do that to you, whether you're fighting it or not. Like you can't help it. You're like, this is gonna get me. You know? That's that's I appreciate the compliment. That for that one, it was it did it went back to the the field of dreams thing that when we kind of stepped into it, like, you know, what's the unexpected way to end this movie? And the the, the expected way is standing ovation. He finds his voice. You know, he's been recognized for this song that has deep meaning for people. That's low hanging fruit, but we're like, you know, what's the universal overlay for people that don't know the song? And it's like at the end of every man's life, especially any person, but especially men, they want their father to stand in approval and applaud and say, well done, you're a man, good job. And so for the earning that moment with Dennis Quaid, uh, uh, like that was, and I, I think the ones that can satisfy, for me, what gets me, like mine would be the movie Warrior, uh, you know, yeah, with Tom, Tom Hardy and Joel Edgerton. Uh, in the ring. Yes, in the, in ring. the ring. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. set the stage where you don't know which individual you want to win. You know, you're rooting for both men. Both of their causes are worthy causes. But when you're able to satisfy it in a moment that's unexpected, I think it's, you know, why it was a privilege to be a part of Ordinary Angels with you guys. You know, I think it's one that will catch audiences off guard. It will be in theaters February 23rd. It's one that I can't recommend enough. Uh, and I think that the other thing that's exciting is we've got other things that we're doing together. One of your other films, Unbreakable Boy, will be coming out soon. I'm excited about that one. And then we've got one other that is on the verge of getting greenlit that we're all going to do together that's going to top all of them that I can't wait to tell people about in the future. So stay tuned. Uh, stay more great tuned films coming you. from the group. And we just have loved the journey with you guys. It's been a worthy, uh, worthy thing. Thanks for being on The Storytellers. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. And let's do it again. Let's go. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll talk soon. Right. Bye. See you. So that's our show today. Uh, so excited to have John Berg and John Gunn on the show to talk about film and all the things that you know have been in our body of work that are similar and uh and just things that we have a common bond over 
Uh, biggest one being Ordinary Angels in theaters February 23rd. Uh, excited to uh, to share that with you guys. You know, when I think about, you know, these guys, the thing that comes to mind is when they both talked about the power of optimism, kind of that unabashed hope uh, and how that communicates with an audience, whether it's a movie like Elf or a documentary like My Date with Drew, you know, or uh, a film like Case for Christ. There's something about just the idea of optimism and hope and embracing that. And I think in today when everything's been so bleak for so long uh, in film, I think it's become very counterculture to have hope and to, to have this optimistic Frank Capra outlook on life. And so uh, I think, you know, as a storyteller, as you look for those stories, uh, there's something about the power of connecting people with the idea of redemption and something to hope in. And uh, it is a visceral emotion that is far lacking in today's films than it needed. And these two individuals have invested their brand in that. So uh, just as you continue to find your story and your voice, uh, look it through the lens of optimism. Uh, it's a powerful thing. So that's it. That's all for the show today. Loved having you guys with us. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next edition of The Storytellers. The Storytellers is a Kingdom Story Company production. It is produced by Nick Carey with production assistance from Ben and Justin Bailey. Our executive producers are Kevin Downs and Brandon Gregory. Social media for the show is run by the team at Troops and Allies, and our music is Twisted Rooster by Tommy Prophet. Special thanks to Jaron Weatherly, Evan Johnston, and our entire team at Kingdom Story Company. We have so many exciting guests coming up this season. To ensure you don't miss any of them, subscribe to The Storytellers for free on YouTube at Kingdom Story Company or wherever you listen to podcasts. For exclusive first looks at our upcoming films, behind the scenes content, and invitations to advanced screenings, join the conversation as a Kingdom Insider at KingdomStoryCompany.com and follow us at Kingdom Story Company across all platforms. As always, thanks for joining Andrew Irwin and his friends on The Storytellers. <laughs>